Hello everybody, and welcome to the Dry Dock, episode 200, part 2. Um, so, hopefully you're coming here through the uh, follow-on link, which I tried to insert in part 1, or A, or whatever I'm calling it. But anyway, uh, enough shenanigans, let's get straight back into questions. Vinve asks, During the Napoleonic era, the Royal Navy had celebrity captains. How about in other ages? For example, were there destroyer captains who were famous in Britain during World War I or World War II, in the same way that fighter aces might have been drummed up in propaganda? To an extent, yes. But at the same time, the way that war had changed made it much harder for such things to occur. There were certainly celebrity admirals. Um, Admiral Cunningham certainly obviously got a very good rep for his enduring campaigns in the Mediterranean. But there there were two basic issues. One was the Napoleonic Wars were basically a generational conflict. Um, you know, you if you include the sort of the the final acts of the last war with Imperial or Royal France, and then obviously the revolution, the war with the revolutionary France, and than the war with fully Napoleonic France, it would be entirely possible for you to have been born into a time when Britain was at war with France, grow up, go to school, get married, and have your own kids, and still be at war with France. You know, you, you could be having your own kids walking around and talking, and you'd still be in this interconnected series of wars with only very marginal periods of peace. So you might not know what peacetime Britain looked like until perhaps you could be in your late 20s or early 30s. Um, which, you know, even the world wars didn't last that long. And in the context of that, obviously, if the war goes on for seemingly forever, then individual captains have a much long much larger amount of time in which to make their mark um, and obviously they are ascending through various different types of ships but all of those kinds of ships have opportunities on the front line you know brigs and sloops and sc uh, schooners and so forth still did manage to capture a fair number of either their opposite numbers or um, enemy merchantmen etc or you know, daringly escape from much larger enemy vessels, or if you were Admiral Cochrane, capture enemy frigates as well, but let's not go there. And then, of course, the frigate is the classic go everywhere, fight everything except for a ship of the line and capture lots of stuff. And then later on, if you got to a ship of the line command, you could get the glory of having fought valiantly in, particular, in a particular battle, a uh, major battle. Whereas in the First sec and Second World Wars with them, quote-unquote, only lasting four to six years, you know, a captain might get... If I mean, there are some ships where the captain stayed on the ship for the entire war, but more generally speaking, a captain, if he started off as a captain, might get through maybe two or three ships during the entire conflict. Um, and although it's a fairly intense... They're, they're world wars, they are fairly intense, the level of on and off all over the world action was not quite the same the same kind of level as you have during the napoleonic era so even when you look at ships and captains who were really heavily involved in world war ii um or world war one for that matter they might still only have less than half a dozen major actions to their name which you know spaced out over that many years and competing with all the other major actions that are going on, and the fact that the, because of the way war had changed, you tended to get more more credit would be given to the Admiral or the Commodore because ships were almost always operating in larger units. It meant that the, the value of specific captains in the public eye was a little bit less than it had been previously. So you, you do get the other ones, you know, Philip Vian, for example, um, making his mark with things like the Altmark incident and then ascending on. But it would be a slightly less famous case. So, you know, if people heard about, oh, yeah, Philip Vian, you know, he he took the Altmark. Fantastic. Great. This is or Captain Manly Power, you know, <laughs> that wonderfully named individual. Um, you're like, OK, 
fantastic. We've heard of him. Good, good show, etc. And then three, four months later, most people have forgotten about it because lots of other things have ha- been happening during the war, both at sea and also obviously on land and in the air. And then maybe Admiral Vian shows up towards the end of the war in a you know, news clipping. Oh, Admiral Vian leading our carriers in the fight in the Western Pacific alongside our American allies. We'll be like, oh yeah, Vian, I remember him. Oh, yeah, a few years ago, he was in the news because of that that whole thing with the German freighter, as opposed to um, in the Napoleonic Wars, where one obviously there wasn't an air war going on for obvious reasons to the land war was sporadic at best in uh, as far as britain was concerned and then everyone was just looking at sea and if you've got a frigate captain he's like oh yes well you know this week so and so frigate has either come into port or sent in a pr- to port with a prize crew yet another prize um and now here come he comes some a month later with a captured french warship it was much easier to build a little bit of more of a cult of personality following um, back in the day. Arsac Cortan asks, Hey Drac, I was just wondering if you could talk briefly about the Halifax explosion and the events that led up to it, as I don't see much coverage of this event despite how important and devastating it was. Well, I am hoping to learn a lot more detail about what happened at the time when I'm in Halifax, uh, later, at the, if you're watching this at the time of release, later this week. Um, but the short version is that you had a, um, a sh- two ships involved. So Halifax Harbour, prior to World War One, didn't allow ships carrying large amounts of volatile cargo on into the harbour, basically to avoid exactly what was about to happen. But during the war, when they were worried about German submarines offshore, people were thinking, well, actually, maybe leaving a you know a ship full of explosives just off of shore, where a German submarine can torpedo it isn't such a good idea either. So now the um, these ships were allowed in. So you had the SS Imo or Imo, um, which was a Norwegian ship. Now this was supposed to be taking more regular supplies to Belgium, and it was in the harbour. And then you had the Mont Blanc, a French cargo ship which was full of explosives, which was coming into the harbour. And the emo had been delayed, so it decided that it was going to make up for make up for um, lost time, and headed out of the harbour. And obviously, Mont Blanc was on her way in. Now, the funny thing is that most of the courts in the aftermath found that the Mont Blanc was at fault for the collision, because what happened late then was a, a collision which spilled some of Mont Blanc's fuel, like a cargo, which caught fire, which then set, eventually would set off the rest of the cargo, and then boom, went the ship, and so did most of Halifax with it. Um, and a few courts' decisions later on found that the two ships were equally to blame. And basically the argument that was put forward was that, well, Mont Blanc knew she was full of explosives, she should have done everything she could to ensure that she wasn't hit. I tend to disagree. Uh, who knows, maybe I'll learn differently once I'm in Halifax, but um, at the, based on the evidence I've read in the UK, I thoroughly disagree with that opinion because the Mont Blanc was travelling on the correct side of the channel at the correct speed. The Emo was travelling on the wrong side of the channel. It already nearly overturned a couple of other ships and was travelling in excess of the speed limit in the channel. And then when Mont Blanc and, you know, said by horn had done the ship equivalent of, oi, what are you doing? Emo had just gone, eh, stuff you, I'm, st- I'm ke- keeping on going. Shockingly enough, this led to uh, a collision um, with obviously devastating consequences. And, yeah, this just probably me that goes, well, <laughs> very rarely will you find, you know, say let's say a car accident involving someone who was driving at the speed limit on the right side of the road and is then hit by somebody who's doing 150 and coming down the wrong side of the road very 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 rarely will the courts ever say that you know the guy who was speeding on the wrong side of the road was completely innocent and the guy who was you know doing what he's supposed to do is the guilty party um so yeah there's a whole bunch of politics involved i think as to why they they tried to blame the mont blanc but 
Regardless, um, the collision set Mont Blanc on fire. The crew realized immediately that what was going to happen and decided, yeah, that, that we're out of here because we don't fancy dying in a massive fireball. Um, they abandoned ship. The ship drifted on, uh, eventually coming to rest on a quay. Um, the crew, to their credit, they, they tried to warn everybody, you know, that their ship's full of explosives. Um, it's going to explode. You probably shouldn't be in this area. And that warning reached far enough that... Um, people at the main railway interchange in Halifax heard about it and were able to signal, albeit at the cost of their lives, that there was an ammunition ship on fire will explode and that no further trains should be sent into Halifax, which probably did save a bunch of people's lives. But through a combination of the fact that not everyone was warned and not everyone who was warned paid any attention, um, the, ha the Mont Blanc then exploded and something like just under 1,800 people were killed in either instantly or near enough instantly, and a lot, lot more were injured uh, by things like flying glass, buildings catching fire, and so on and so forth. So it was a huge tragedy um, and led to quite a number of changes to various regulations and, as I say, something of a bizarre set of court, court proceedings. But, you know, hopefully I will learn more, more about it when I'm in Halifax and might be even able to present a video on it at some point when I get back. October Nid asks, given the paranoid media swirlings around the South American dreadnoughts when they were ordered, was there any discussion about the substitution of Amagi with Kaga, or was the Kanto earthquake a well enough understood fact to quiet any such concerns down? I am not aware of any major concerns. I mean, apart from anything, people understood in naval circles that getting Kaga in place of Amagi was a significant downgrade for the Japanese Navy. So on the face of it, obviously, it, that's not a good thing um, for the Japanese, but it's a good thing for everybody else who doesn't want the Japanese to have nice things. And the Great Kanto Earthquake, well, clues in the name, it was a very well-known disaster. There was huge amounts of devastation. Uh, it was very widely reported on. And, uh, yeah, well... As you can see from the photo, Amagi's hull wasn't exactly concealed. Um, so, along with air, air, rescue efforts and aid work, it was entirely possible to see that, yeah, in fact, that thing is pretty much totaled. Um, so, yeah, no, no one was particularly worried that um, Karga would provide either a superior option to Amagi or that perhaps the Japanese were, cons were sort of making things up and they were going to, I guess maybe try and sneak finish Amagi as a carrier whilst also then having a Kagi and Kaga. Um, everyone seems to have been pretty much on board with what had gone on and why and accepted the results thereof. Primark359 asks, in planning your second trip to the States, are there any ports or museums that you've already discounted as not worth it because of their content and distance from other sites? I assume the one Cold War destroyer in Bremerton would fall into this category. But what about U505? Is there enough elsewhere on the Great Lakes to make that worth it? So, as far as I'm concerned, when it comes to visiting places in the US, I'm not ruling anything out as long as it has relevance to the channel. So, you know, it could be a single destroyer or submarine, um, or indeed U505 in Chicago. And if I can, within the scope of the schedule, I will visit it. Um... The only exception is kind of like, as you mentioned, if there's a if there's a ship that is purely a Cold War vessel, um, so it's built well after 1950, and that's the only thing they've got there, if it's nearby to a, another ship that I might be visiting otherwise, then sure, I'll go and have a look. But if it's way out on its own, then obviously... You know, it's unfortunately not worth me going to have a look at at this time because, well, it does cost a fair bit um, to go and see these these things. If you add up, you know, the flights and in the case of this last trip, the flights, the RV hire, the food, the fuel, the campsite fees, etc., etc., etc. There's a considerable investment involved in visiting each vessel. Um to the point that I'm I'm not entirely confident that I'll actually make a profit on the on the whole trip, but it was very 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 uh, enlightening. And to be honest, you know, 
there's non-tangible benefits from a trip like that as well. So, yeah, as, as long basically as long as I can make a video about it, it's it will be on the list. But obviously, there are only so many hours in the day. There are only so many days in a week or a month, and distances are also a thing. So, um, if it can fit within a route that doesn't require me to drive more than three or four hours a day, this is absolutely great. Um, but if you know if there's a ship that's going to require me to take a 12 hour diversion because there's not an airport nearby or something like that then that doesn't really fit within the scope of what's feasible on a, on a particular route so we'll just have to see how everything goes brilliantly clueless asks if i heard correctly in the last dry dock you mentioned that the new mexico class was your favorite u.s standard battleship class so why no five minute guide well, it's because the five-minute guides work on the principle that the first one of each month is voted for by the people on Patreon, and the other three or four, however many the month allows for, come about from a list that is basically near enough as makes some difference, a chronological list of requests from the channel. So the New Mexico class apparently is not as beloved by as many people as it is by me. Um, so it's a little, it is on the list. It's just a little bit further down the list and I will get to it at some point. Um, but I, I'm not going to push my personal preferences up the list just arbitrarily because I can. Um, and it just makes it all the sweeter when I eventually get round to it. Reva asks, what do the British know of Bismarck's capabilities at the time they had to hunt her down? Presumably they'd gotten a look at her to guess her displacement was oversized, her armour would be pretty apparent, but top speed, armour, range, etc. And how would they know what they knew? They had a relatively good idea of what Bismarck was capable of. Partly because, well, to be perfectly frank, the Germans wouldn't shut up about it when they were building it. Bismarck was a huge propaganda thing um, for the Germans. So an awful lot was published, at least internally, and at least until the war started, it wasn't exactly difficult to get hold of some of that information. Plus, of course, there was the more standard intelligence routes. There was the, you know, this is what the published data on the ship is. Let's run the observed dimensions, etc. past our um, intelligence and naval officers and the, you know, the, especially the constructors. They can reverse engineer it and see if everything lines up with approximately what they say. So between all of that, they were, they knew roughly how quick she was. They knew what her armament was going to be. They estimate, well, they started with a rule of thumb estimation that she'd be protected against her own guns at the average combat distances. Uh, and in terms of operational range, whilst they might not have exact figures, they were aware of, you know, what, the Germans were trying to do with their fleet so they concluded she had a, probably had a relatively decent range and that they to be honest regardless of that they didn't want her out there anyway plus of course they had the wartime experience by the time Bismarck sailed of observing the Scharnhorsts and the Deutschlands so they were aware that the German ships could stay out at sea for a fairly substantial amount of time especially if they managed to find themselves some resupply so they had a fairly good handle on what Bismarck was capable of um, about the only thing that they seem a little bit uncertain of, given the transmissions that go back and forth both before and after Denmark Strait, is just exactly how powerful her guns are. They know they're 15-inch guns, they've got 15-inch guns, they know that the German 15-inch guns are newer and probably a bit more powerful, but, say, the degree to which th that is, they're not sure, which is why you get a whole series of orders and tactics that change after the destruction of Hood, because, of course, remember at the time, they don't know exactly why Hood has been destroyed, but the Admiralty assumes that she's been hit straight through the main armor belt, which, as it turns out, probably wasn't, almost certainly was not the case. But they, you know, they took the worst possible interpretation and then said, right, well, to be on the safe side, we'll assume that this is the case and work from that, which is why, for example, Renown was told that, uh, not to engage Bismarck in a one-on-one, -on -one, but if, the, you know, she wasn't forbidden from engaging Bismarck, but she was told to basically wait until somebody else is fighting her as well. So, theoretically, Renown could have gotten on the kicking uh, of Bismarck when she was in her last fight, but didn't. 
Toreno asks, During the Age of Sail, it was common for ships to have figureheads representing the ship, e.g. a unicorn for HMS Unicorn, a figure of Nelson for HMS Nelson, etc., etc. How were figureheads done for ships that represented places or events? For example, HMS Gibraltar has the figurehead of a man in a uniform that I don't recognise. Would this have been an important figure from the time related to Gibraltar? Uh, and how would something like HMS Trafalgar or HMS Orion be represented? And did different nations have different approaches to figureheads for ships named after places or ideas? So it depends on exactly how esoteric you want to get. And trust me, figurehead representations could get very weird and esoteric when there wasn't a direct obvious correlation. So there was some stuff that's obvious. For example, here's HMS Warrior. The figure of a warrior on the front is, you know, it's not exactly subtle. It's fairly obvious at that point what what's going on, and as you mentioned, Nelson is Nelson, a unicorn is a unicorn, and so on and so forth. When you start to get into the more weird ones, though, um, so if it's a place, a city, or something like that, you have a couple of choices. Most usually, uh, a place would have its coat of arms represented. Um, so, you know, Hampshire, Surrey. Uh, Plymouth, that kind of thing. You could you could have a coat of arms for the city, town, county, whatever. That would suffice. Um, alternatively, you could have somebody very famous from that area or related to that, like you said, the, the on Gibraltar, a figure of a person, um, perhaps related to the capture of Gibraltar or the relief of the great siege of Gibraltar, that was relevant to the time of the ship. Um, because it was as much for everyone to recognise what the ship was um, without having to go to the stern and read it off the back than anything else. And then you have a, a third option, which wasn't usually widely exercised, but occasionally, which would be if you didn't want to do a full coat of arms, you could look for something rather distinctive on a place's coat of arms and then take that. So, for example, if if there was a town where this coat of arms was just a field with a, with a tower on it, then the figurehead might just be a tower um, that was modelled after the one on the coat of arms. Something like Orion, well, you could use uh, Orion the Hunter, the you know, Greek legend, so that would be a fairly obvious one. Um, then things like battles, like Trafalgar, or something you might have a you might actually have something like Nelson or again even though you might also have a Nelson on HMS Nelson um, i.e. someone connected with that battle quite uh, intuit intuitively but there would be additional factors involved in the figurehead to clue people in that you know this is a person associated with a place albeit you know it could be a little bit odd so like the hms gibraltar one you mentioned it has a key carved into the section just below the the bust of the figure and that's because the gibraltar is the key to the mediterranean but you you'd have to put a few leaps of logic together to to work that one out um and then when you get to ideas well usually there was some ancient mythological figure you could call upon so whilst hms victory has obviously a, a big coat of arms as part of her figurehead um you could also go with say athena nike um, the Greek goddess of victory, that would be an acceptable thing in, in terms of 18th, 19th century ships figureheads to represent the idea of victory. Um, and then things, yeah, things start to get very, very odd once you go down that rabbit hole. Eric J. Van Duting asks, I was reading one of Nathan Oaken's articles on metallurgy and armour, and he notes that France was the only country that used face-hardened armour for the turret and conning tower roofs in World War II ship designs, believing that near-vertical bomb hits from aircraft were a greater risk to be a greater risk than long-distance shell hits from enemy ships. Could you compare the relative amount of protection offered against armour-piercing bombs from face-hardened armour versus the homogenous armour that was almost exclusively used for horizontal protection on other ships? So, of course, it is a very complicated set of metallurgy that um, differentiates face-hardened from homogenous armour, but as a rough guide, face-hardened armour deals with incoming threats by stopping them cold. It basically engages them in an unstoppable force meets immovable object contest, with obviously armour being the immovable object, with the idea that... Um, it will destroy or damage the projectile enough that either it 
fails to penetrate, or if it does penetrate, it doesn't penetrate in a state with its you know worth noting beyond a spray of shrapnel. Um, whereas homogenous armor, non-face hardened armor, um, can't do as much damage to an incoming shell, so is generically inferior to stopping attacks coming in that are basically perpendicular or close to it. But when you're looking at attacks that are coming in at a very low angle, you're skimming, uh, like, say, a shell coming in at 20,000 yards that hits the top of a turret roof, for example, well, homogenous armor, because it is not hard, it is therefore ductile, um, so to a degree, it will bend, flex, and move as it gets hit, which actually helps in rejecting or deflecting a projectile. So at very low angles of um, attack, homogenous armor is actually, for a given thickness, better than face hardened armor, because face hardened armor force basically forces the confrontation very, very quickly. So all the energy of the incoming shell has to either make it or break it um, through the armor near enough on the spot. Um, and even if the shell deflects, it's entirely possible that it cause a lot of splintering and cracking and so on and so forth. Whereas a homogenous plate might just bounce the thing off, uh, and even if it takes some damage, it might have a groove cut through it, but still, you know, deflect off the shell, um, as opposed to face hardened armor, which basically either fails or succeeds for the most part. There's, there's a very narrow margin in which it might the armor might fail but still rip up the shell enough uh, to do damage. But, you know, there's that that's kind of a, a, a very narrow window of, of, of error. Now, when it comes to the choice of what you put on your turret roof, if you think that your main attack is going to be from shells, i.e. shells, so shells are coming in at, you know, 45 degrees or less, um, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20 degrees or something, then homogenous armor makes a lot more sense because then the shell will hopefully be deflected off. The homogenous armor in, for, in a perpendicular attack won't offer as much resistance, so if someone does drop a armor-piercing bomb on you from high up, then you may be in a little bit of trouble. The flip side, however, is, of course, that, um, you know, if you have the face-hardened armor, then sure, the people can, if you've got a decent amount of face-hardened armor, you can drop bombs on that turret all day, and they'll probably just smash themselves helplessly against it. But if you then get hit by a shell that's coming in at, say, 30 degrees, there's actually a slightly higher chance that the shell will penetrate or will scatter large amounts of fragments from spalling into the turret, as opposed to if that had been um, homogenous. So, the if, if, as you say, that the French think that bomb hits are the more worrying, then, yeah, go with a face hardened. And if you don't, then go with the homogenous. The only other thing to mention on that is, of course, that the depth of the armor also makes a difference, or the thickness. So bil once you get down to a certain thinness of armor plate, uh, then face hardening it doesn't work very well at all, because one, you can't get the correct depth very easily, and two, you know, there's not a, there's even if you can get a, a depth to it, there's not going to be a lot of backing to it. So you've effectively created a glass-like protection um, with with thin face hardened armor, which is why you only really see face hardened armor um, on ships above certain thicknesses, because below it actually is very very counterproductive. So if you're going to have face hardened armor on your turret roofs, period, you have to make sure those turret roofs are actually reasonably thick in the first place. Megascro asks, in the Vasa video, the curator said that there were huge flames, something like 30 foot long, coming out of the replica cannon. Could something like that be worked into a fire-throwing cannon? No real projectile, just a lot of propellant and some wadding to keep it in place to produce a flame as big as possible. It would seem rather devastating in a near close action or counter-boarding action to me. Technically, yes, but in practice, it's not really viable. Now, in certain naval combats, there are accounts of, you know, broadsides occurring and the flash and the fire from the cannons actually setting fire to nearby enemy ships, which then have to 
put out because you don't want the fire to spread to yourself. That did definitely happen. But in terms of an anti-boarding weapon, well, there, there's two issues. One is that if you, you know, f fire a cannon that is just propellant and just accelerate a lot of, um, well, for one thing, a lot of unburnt gunpowder is just going to come out. Uh, but e even if you address that, you know, a flame-throwing cannon that's based purely on gunpowder will create a short-lived burst of flame that might singe and burn and so forth, but it's usually not going to last long enough to do major damage. Um, I mean, it's not good if you've got your eyes open and get hit in the face by it, but compared to the same cannon with a canister shot stuck in front of it, the canister shot's going to do a heck of a lot more permanent damage to anything in its path um, than just a big flame. Now, potentially if you had some kind of canister full of flammable liquid, maybe a, a pot or a can full of, um, you know, some kind of st strong alcohol or, nat or oil or something, and then fired that and created a spray of liquid fire, that might work. But then you run into the problem of, well, we're storing flammable liquids aboard a ship for, you know, 99.9% .9 of the time. So the chances are you probably end up losing far more ships to accidents with the flammable liquids than you would ever would inflict damage by firing those at people. Um, and obviously has a very limited um, field of use as opposed to solid shot and canister and grape, which are fairly universal, you know, point-and-click interfaces for removing people from existence. The Dane they call Chateau asks, could you please, 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 please try to pronounce the Danish and English name for the Danish capital to the best of your ability? Also, during World War II, the US Navy declared open hunting season on Japanese cruisers. Was this on general principle, or was there a particular reason for this? Well, you asked for it. Apologies to any other Danish listeners, but so in English, the Danish capital or the capital of Denmark is usually pronounced either Copenhagen or Copenhagen, depending on uh, apparently nothing. Um, some people call it one, some people call it the other. However, um, apparently in Danish, it is a little bit different, where it's apparently something along the lines of Copenhagen. Um, Please give my give my Kerben a uh, rating out of five Danish viewers. And if I got it horrifically wrong, my apologies in advance. As for open hunting season on Japanese cruisers, um, it's mostly a matter of just general principle. The Japanese cruisers were prob were evaluated, apart from obviously their carriers, to be the biggest possible threat to the US because the Japanese didn't show that much inclination to use their capital ships outside of certain circumstances. So although they were a big threat when they showed up, they didn't show up that often. Um, the destroyers, somewhat shorter range, somewhat more fragile, somewhat easier to deal with. Um, although, you know, ev everything the Japanese had was a threat, but there's degrees of threat. Whereas the cruisers could go long distances. They had the armament to really mess things up if they got close to stuff. Um, or if they got a long range of certain things. Uh, they had obviously torpedoes, so they could even threaten battleships and carriers fairly comprehensively. So if you look at the individual units and their capabilities of doing damage, plus with the how often those units showed up, the Japanese cruisers posed the biggest threat on a per-ship basis to US efforts, and thus, well, hunt them down. Patrick Donnelly asks, in a previous dry dock, you mentioned that the range on US Navy submarines in World War II would actually work against them if they were deployed to the Mediterranean. Could you elaborate on that? Sure, it's not the range itself per se, it's what is implied by that range. So something that all sides, whether it be German, Italian or British, relatively quickly figured out when it came to the Mediterranean was that big subs tended to have fairly short life expectancies. There are, of course, always exceptions to the rule, but the casualty rates amongst the bigger subs, so T-class for the British, Type 9s for the Germans, and various individual classes for the Italians, were much, much higher than smaller craft, like well, other various Italian classes, the Type 7s for the Germans, and the U-class, for example, for the British. And the reason for that is that 
one, the Mediterranean is a very enclosed environment, so it's much more likely that an enemy ship or aircraft is going to come across you, at which point the ability to dive really quickly is very useful, and by and large the smaller the sub, the quicker it can dive, because there's less buoyancy to overcome. Um, secondly, the waters of the Mediterranean are usually surprisingly clear um, and often relatively shallow, so a large submarine might have difficulty manoeuvring uh, in the shallower areas, and also something that is still an issue to this day, you can be relatively far down in a sub, you know, in the order of tens of meters, and from the air you can still be seen pretty darn clearly because the water is relatively clear. Now, you obviously can paint your submarine for camouflage and so on and so forth, but the bigger you are, the easier you are to spot, and the further down you'll be spotted. A smaller sub is more difficult to spot and will disappear into the into the diff light diffracting murk a lot quicker than in a lot shallower water than a larger sub will. So, yeah, it's, as I said, it's not that the range itself works against the US subs, it's the fact that because they have this range, they are, by inference, larger vessels, and the, for the reasons we just discussed, the larger the vessel, the more it's going to struggle in somewhere like the Mediterranean. Um, if you had, if for example, if you're the US and you had to, for whatever reason, deploy subs to the Mediterranean, believe it or not, you'd probably actually want to use the S-Class, because they are a little bit smaller, and therefore slightly less likely to be spotted and sunk. Christopher Ryan asks, Having gone through multiple museum ships, were there any times when you saw something on one ship, wondered what it was or how it worked, and then went on another ship and got the context that you needed to explain your question? Uh, for me, it was the winch and pulley system on the Iowa class. I saw the offset winch on New Jersey, but didn't realise they used a pulley mounted to the turret roof in order to bring the shells through the centre of the loading hatch. For me, not so much, um, but that's partly a combination of my own nature and the absolutely wonderful people who showed me around the various museum ships. Um, so you know, mo mo most of the people who showed me around the museum ships can back this up. Um, Generally speaking, if I saw something that I wondered, oh, how does that work, or what what is that, I'd ask. Um, and if there was a lot of information to go with it, um, or it was brand new to me, I would shut up. <laughs> um, so basically, when I was on the tours, I kind of had two modes: either happy chatty drac, which was you know. You know, I'm asking questions about all these new things, I want to learn about them, and generally obviously also talking with the people who are showing me around. And then when you get the information download, I'm just like, okay, I'm going to be quiet and listen now because there's a lot of interesting things and brain has to process and, and you know, file away all this for later. Um, and as a result, you know, if I do see something that I'm thinking, oh, I wonder what that does. I tend to just go, um, what does this do? Why is this here? Or if I think I know, I'll go, does this do this and go to that? Or, and then someone will usually come in and say either yes, well done, or no, actually this does this, this, and this. Because um, I like information, so I keep an eye out for that kind of thing. However, um, with that said, there are, there were times on various museum ships where I came across things that I either just hadn't noticed or flat out hadn't thought about. And so someone might, well, um, Actually, speaking of the loading hatch that's next to the turrets that you mentioned. So, when I was on Massachusetts, which you can see here, and we saw some of those, and it's like, ah, oh, okay, so these are the loading hatches where the shells go down. Great, fantastic, fine. And then I'm collating that with information in my own head, and I know from various battleships that there are a number of ways of loading the shells down into there, up to and including little portable A-frame cranes and so forth. So um, my brain went, okay, so this is where it actually went in. Um, there are a variety of ways of how it could be done. So now, now this is sufficient information. And then I think, if I remember correctly, I think it was actually when I was on USS Alabama on the aft turret um, on the roof, and one of the gentlemen who was showing me around pointed out, said, "Oh yeah, look, these are the these are the mounting points for um, 
the crane that would be used to load the shells. And I was like, oh, that's how they do it on this ship. Okay. Hadn't thought about that. I just assumed that because there wasn't a crane in an obvious position nearby, that therefore there must have been one of the ships where everything was done with portable cranes, which I suppose technically it was because it's not a permanent fixed emplacement. It's just not a portable crane in the way that I'd thought of it before. And I was like, oh, okay, this makes a lot of sense. Happy days, carrying on, new information acquired. Um, but, so yeah, that, that would be one of those. And yeah, there are a few other times things like that happened. Peter Guy asks, in Drylock 181 at the 2807 mark, the, there's an image of a ship which appears to have an extremely stubby bow and stern forward and aft of its centerline turrets. What is the name of the ship and what is the reason for its stubby appearance? And why does it have so many float planes? Well, this is actually the USS Minneapolis, a New Orleans class cruiser, except it's, um, well, missing a section of its bow, which completely throws off its lines and makes it look very odd, I must admit. Um, the reason for the numerous float planes is, again, it's a New Orleans class cruiser. They had a lot of the mounted amidships. Uh, the stubby stern Partly that's just the effect of the bow throwing off the visual impression of the lines. Partly also it's not entirely perpendicular to the camera. I think the stern is just a fraction further away, which makes it appear a little bit narrower as well. So, yeah, she, she's a fairly conventional cruiser, but this is in the aftermath of the Battle of Tassafaronga, which is why I was using her as the background to a question on good and bad officers, because, well, let's face it, um, Carlton Wright was not the world's best United States Navy officer, um, since he managed to end up with, well, this happening, and this wasn't the worst of it, um, to various ships in his command. The almighty Hypnotoad asks, St. Brendan of Clonfair is best known for his fantastical voyage where he visits many mystical islands, and a whale that he thought was an island. I've heard a few arguments that Brendan's voyage may be semi-historical, especially in terms of the Island of Grapes, which may be the same as Vinland, where the Vikings landed. Vinland as a rough area is generally considered to be Newfoundland or in the St. Lawrence area. Given the time of his alleged voyage, around the 500s, and the technology of the era, do you think Brendan and his companions might have reached the New World even before the Vikings? Why or why not? I mean, it's it's entirely possible. It's been proven since that the kind of vessel that he's reputed to have sailed in, whilst I wouldn't personally want to sail across the Atlantic, I mean, to be honest, in the kind of vessel he's described as using, I wouldn't even necessarily feel that confident sailing across a particularly large river in it, but nevertheless, it can make it across the Atlantic in stages. There's actually nothing restricting it from doing so. I mean, people row and sail across the Atlantic in glorified kayaks these days, so it seems pretty much anything you can keep watertight can actually go transoceanic as long as you have enough food aboard um, and fresh water. So, yeah, there's nothing strictly forbidding him from having made a voyage to some part of North America, and other parts of his account do seem to correlate with slightly fantastical descriptions of areas in the North Atlantic that people up until that point hadn't necessarily described. So um, at one point they describe a place where, you know, big lumps of molten rock and, and fire are thrown around and the land is covered in golden rivers of fire, um, which could very well be Iceland if they sailed near Iceland when a volcano was erupting. Um, talk about things like pillars of crystal okay that's basically you know an iceberg to people who've never seen one before um it's the same thing like sometimes uh, you know, these days it's becoming less and less common but even as recently as 10 to 20 years ago you could get people who would come from a third world country that maybe hadn't had a lot of outside contact with the west um especially if they came from an outlying area of that third world country. And when you first step into a lift or an elevator for you Americans, they'd kind of look at you very bizarrely. It's like, why is everyone crowding into the small metal room? Um, <laughs> you know, things that are outside your context of reference, you'll describe in a way that you understand. So, you know, similarly, you know, they've, they know of crystal, um, they've seen quartz crystals and stuff. They see a big iceberg. It's like, well, we have no comprehension of ice that can come in anything like this size. So, I guess crystal? 
okay big crystal thing okay fine great fantastic um and if that is the case and they're kind of they've gone past iceland they've drifted into the northern latitudes where icebergs are wandering around that potentially indicates they'd already made it a fair bit over the atlantic and given that again before columbus there's a fairly good indication that bristol fishermen were quite habitually fishing off the grand banks of newfoundland the idea that someone with you know just on a random voyage having staged their way across could make it to somewhere in america yeah i can i can see it happening um of course with such a small voyage and not sticking around there's going to be precious little direct physical evidence they ever did apart from their written account but i see no reason to particularly discount it mr v asks i've always heard that the second battle of sabine pass or possibly sabine pass um, is a battle that comes down to the superior training of the very tiny confederate side though this while at least partially right seems overblown six six old smoothbore cannon don't seem like they should have been able to defeat multiple gunships is this battle a case of the skill of the davis guard or is this really more the union force massively underestimating their foes and lo then losing because of their own lack of preparation it's a mixture of both i mean when you read the as a historian when you read the battle plan which is you know our gunboats will sail up to the fortifications silence the fortifications and then the troops will land unopposed and take the surrender you almost immediately want to slam your head straight through a desk because there have been so 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 many amphibious assault plans that have read similarly you know We'll sail up, we'll destroy the enemy forts, we'll silence their guns, and then the troops will land. They won't have to do anything, they'll just take the surrender. Never in all of existence has that ever worked. Um, you know, outside of a few very, very, very lucky shot times, like maybe when you touch off a magazine or something, but just by sheer brute force silencing the guns and then invading, that is basically um, how to set up a fail failure by sheer ignorance of history so yeah the union side definitely did not prepare properly for this however the flip side to that is that well i mean another element of the fact they didn't prepare they didn't send anything armored um they sent well, as you can see a bunch of gunboats um no particular protection between any of them and that made them vulnerable even to old guns because you know armor was what protected you from old guns and most of the new ones <laughs> so that's another problem a uh, third problem which comes along in terms of again lack of preparedness they didn't bother to chart out the river so they didn't know exactly what was going on there so yeah there's a lot of not unpreparedness on the union side however the flip side to that is that in theory if both sides have been equally unprepared then the Union might still have been able to pull off a win there because the gunboats could have eventually worked themselves into a position where they could range on the fortifications. The fortifications would obviously be trying to hit them. And the gunboats collectively had considerably more firepower than the fortifications. So in a gradual war of attrition, they, would have, they should have won. But this is where the skill of the small Confederate garrison comes in because they practiced their gunnery they'd established what all the ranges were on the river and so when the gunboats came into play they were able to just go oh okay he's there right therefore that means for this kind of shot we need this charge because it's at that range bang very very accurate fire and that was really what did in the the union squadrons the fact that thanks to their preparations and their skill the confederate side was able to put down very accurate fire even with old smoothbore cannon and thus start racking up the damage on the Union ships before the Union ships had got a chance to settle in and establish their own range. So, yeah, it, it's a mixture of both, but just the Union lack of preparedness, I don't think, lost them the battle. If, the, if you'd had an average or unskilled garrison, even with the, the mess the Union had made of planning, they might still have pulled it off. But when they, you had an unprepared assault going in against a very well-prepared and highly skilled garrison, it probably was never going to work out any other way than the way that it did. Bird Dog asks, If I recall correctly, during the Battle of Heligoland Bight in 1914, the German battle cruisers couldn't join the battle due to a sandbank at the entrance to Wilhelmshaven being impassable for capital ships during low tide. 
And I think during the Russo-Japanese War, there was a similar issue with Port Arthur. In the case of Port Arthur, I assume that either the Russian Navy didn't have the equipment to dredge the channels or the seafloor was too rocky, but I don't think either was the case for Wilhelmshaven. Why didn't the Germans dredge channels? Am I wrong about their ability to do so, or was it just not seen as an issue? And if you were in charge of the Navy in this time period, to what lengths would you have gone to avoid basing your capital ships in a port limited in such a way? So the main problem that the Germans have is that pretty much the entirety of their coast is relatively shallow and full of sandbanks and so forth for quite a distance out from you know where the land ends. This is a big problem for any kind of major harbour because whilst there are certain channels through, they're shifting quite often, sometimes they're fairly obvious, um, and their viability varies for ships with a deep draft anyway at high and low tide. Um, one of the major problems you're going to face if you're the Germans trying to get out of Wilhelmshaven is, in theory, yes, you might be able to dredge a channel that would work in all water conditions, but you're going to face two problems. Firstly, it's going to be hugely, hugely expensive, and it probably isn't going to last all that long because on that kind of scale, um, the tides and the silt that they carry, etc., is probably going to fill it up fairly quickly. The second one, however, is that it's also a hugely obvious point of exit, um, which means the enemy can put mines and submarines and everything waiting for you. Whereas if you wait for the Jade Bar to be deep enough to cover, well, the enemy can't cover the entire area with things to stop you. And if they do try and put the odd mine or two or sub out there, you can sweep for that specifically. Um, but that's making the best of a bad situation. Fundamentally, as I said, the problem is most the, the German coast generally is a fairly shallow water environment, and the Germans, compared to their total land area, don't have that much coast. So it's a case of, well, this is one of our few decent large natural harbours. I guess we're going to have to make use of that better than nothing. And it's the same kind of thing with Port Arthur. Yeah, it's not the ideal port by any stretch of the imagination, but it's also the only one the Russians have in the area that's got anything like the capability of maintaining a fleet. So if I was in charge of a navy, yeah, I definitely don't want a port that can where my fleet can be bottled in or boxed out by the tide. Um, so I'd do my level best to find somewhere that wasn't like that, but I'm also not going to give myself such an obvious weak spot as you know this is the only way in and out guys make sure you've got all your stealthy ambush stuff waiting off there um it's actually better at that point to just wait for the for the tide than to you know basically put the target on your back but the larger issue is that as with Zilham Simon and Port Arthur and a few other places I may not have a choice it may be either you get a substandard port or you don't get any port at all and at that case, well, yeah, literally any port in a storm. Gabriel A. Hawkins asks, The US Coast Guard has a motto of, so others may live, yet in times of war, the Coast Guard is folded into the US Navy. When this happens, does the Coast Guard change its motto to, so others may die? <laughs> Joking aside, are you familiar with any problems associated with transferring an organisation that is ostensibly a life-preserving unit into an organisation that is primarily directed at waging war? Well, with the U.S. Coast Guard specifically, they are actually part of the U.S. Armed Forces. They're listed as such, and of course they carry weapons, they are responsible for enforcement of laws and all sorts of other things. So the U.S. Coast Guard in specifically shifting over from um, peacetime to a wartime role wouldn't be as hard as you might otherwise imagine because they were used to the idea of let's say, carrying weapons and using them in the enforcement of their duties. And, well, as far as the life-saving part goes, when you're escorting a bunch of convoys, there could be plenty of life-saving going on, whether that be from ships that got hit and sunk or from U-boats that you might have found and killed. So, yeah, the, the US Coast Guard probably didn't have too much of a problem going to a war footing. Generally speaking, you tend to find that life-preserving organisations in other countries like various Coast Guards, because they will also tend to have a quasi-military role, they are then not too much fussed about being absorbed into the military in times of war. Um, and where you have such organisations as purely life-saving, uh, like, say, the RNLI in the UK, uh, 
they either well the organization won't get folded into a, a wartime organization you might have individuals volunteer um but if the organization as a whole volunteers its services for the war effort specifically what you're more likely to see is rather than just you know for, again using the uk as an example rather than drafting the rnli into hunting for enemy submarines or something like that you might see them instead operating things like the 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 fast launches that we use to rescue pilots from the channel because rescuing people at sea in all weathers from small craft is their specialization and there is a call for that even in a military organization so might as well put them to use where their skills are best serve the cause gb asks you mentioned in the collapse of the treaty system in the mid 1930s in the alaska class video I presume that this collapse did not happen overnight and was more of a gradual process. Can you please describe the succession of events that led to this collapse? Did some of the parties officially withdraw from the treaty, or was it simply a matter of the treaties being progressively ignored by everyone? In some ways, it was kind of both. So there was somewhat endemic cheating amongst certain nations, such as Italy and Japan, who were signatories to the treaty in in advance of the collapse of the treaty system itself. So particularly in the realms of heavy cruisers, and in the Italian case, the initial designs for the Littorio class. But those were what I would call vaguely concealable. I, you could make some kind of plausible claim that they were treaty compliant. Um, and of course, Japanese slights have had with the sort of building the Megamis and calling them light cruisers, so as not to overburden their heavy cruisers. Uh, heavy cruiser allocation even though everyone was looking at going i'm pretty sure those are those are probably going to be heavy cruisers at some point at least in some circles um in others they still believe they were light cruisers well into the war when they weren't um but in any case so th- there's this kind of as i say the plausible deniability aspect which was going on but as various bits and pieces like the Italian heavy cruiser displacements were gradually being exposed, there was this feeling that perhaps, you know, it's not working out quite as well as it could. And I think this is why you started to see a lot of designs from the nations that were in compliance, especially the UK and the US, that were beginning to be fitted the sort of for but not with and some, to be fair, some of the what I suspect was for, but not within some in both of those nations, was kind of their own sleight of hand at circumventing the treaty systems. Effectively, almost everyone was cheating them in some way, shape, or form. The only difference was were they cheating them in terms of just blatantly lying about the displacement of their ships, or were they cheating them in terms of designing ships that were plausible enough and actually compliant with the restrictions, but had special sort of had design elements built in so that they could be improved in a way that didn't actually compromise their overall performance later on and so so that's the kind of the underlying stuff and then you have there is also a rather more abrupt overnight bit which is that you've got the second london naval treaty coming up and then japan just says no no, nah, we're we're withdrawing. We're we're not we're not doing this anymore, which obviously is a relatively abrupt thing. People had just begun to suspect at that point that they were already planning on or were already building um, oversized vessels. Well, they didn't guess at quite how oversized the Yamatos were going to be. But when that came in, then the escalator clause could be invoked, which allowed um, obviously everyone to go up to sixteen-inch guns and forty-five thousand tons. But it was fairly clear after a pretty short period of time that in this also was not going to help because the escalator clause was still a limitation on what various nations could build when then if it became clear that other nations were just completely flat out ignoring the treaty, then the only thing that was left was to completely flat out ignore it as well. So there was, there was, a, there was an underlying current of various kinds of circumvention of the treaty to a small degree going on japan kicked off the collapse of it but the collapse of the system after that took a year or two max um to go from you know london treaty 35,000 on 14 inch to whatever you want (laughs) 
SMS Schleswig Holstein asks, could it be argued that the British blockade of Germany was a, and maybe the, decisive part in the Allied victory in World War I? Yes, I think it definitely can be argued that way, for a couple of reasons. Firstly, it stopped the majority of the German fleet from getting out. So it stopped the Germans from significantly disrupting the trade lanes even more than they did with their U-boats, which, you know, was pretty disruptive in and of itself. But if the blockade backed up by the fleet hadn't been there, then the high seas fleet would have been at liberty to at least send its cruisers and battle cruisers out to do even more damage or to blockade Britain. So there's there's that prevention element. And then, of course, you have the blockade itself. Now, what does that stop Germany from doing? Well, it stops them from importing all sorts of things, but particularly war material, the things that are determined to be vital to the war effort. And not being able to access those materials, as well as most of the global trade network, did have a significant impact on Germany. So um, they weren't able to import certain key naturally occurring components of explosives, which forced them to then develop artificial explosives production. So granted, they could still manufacture explosives, but they couldn't manufacture them in the quantities or for the same cost as they could before. Uh, Likewise with fuel. The high seas fleet took a fair performance hit from not being able to import high quality anthracite coal from elsewhere, having to make do with bulk loaded bituminous coal. That had an effect on their fleet's ability to wage war. The blockade also meant that there were food shortages in Germany. So they had ersatz foods, um, which were, you know, other cheaper foods that weren't necessarily quite as good standing in for the the better foods and then they had ersatz ersatz foods which were you know even worse stand-ins for the stand-ins towards the end now that sounds very cruel and indeed it almost certainly was because when you look at charts of developmental growth in things like german children which obviously unfortunately you have to use that metric because adults have finished their growing phase you can see the effects of the shortages caused by the british blockades in the fact that there's a significant dip in the overall height of children which during that period and immediately thereafter, which reflects a lack of nutrition during some of the most critical phases of growth. Now, of course, the Germans did do their best to keep their frontline troops supplied, but it meant there were still limits to the supplies that they could give to their frontline troops. Then there were even more limits to what the civilians at home could have. And whilst in, in and of itself this doesn't knock Germany out of the war, it does mean that the troops on the front line are going to have less energy to do things and the people who are still at home who are working uh, to produce the explosives, produce the rations and all the other things also have less energy to produce things. So the overall economic output goes down because you can't run a war economy for four years on patriotism. So it's lots of individual little bits. Plus, of course, obviously the German economy cuts off from global trade means they have less money to go around. So what the blockade does is it makes things much more expensive, it makes things much harder to produce, it means a lot more energy and effort is being put into trying to find substitutes, and it means that the German population as a whole is less well nourished and therefore is less able to accomplish things as compared to everyone else. So it's a gradual de- degradation across the board of Germany's capability to fight, and then you compare it to what they theoretically could have done if the blockade hadn't been in place and they had been able to freely trade and you see actually there is a fairly marked gap that the the blockade creates and whilst the blockade in and of itself doesn't necessarily starve germany into surrender by the time that they you know sign the uh, the armistice and then later the peace treaty well two things one it certainly put them in a position where the Allies had an advantage and could force them to, you know, uh, uh, force them to surrender. But secondly, if the war had continued on, uh, quite apart from the fact that obviously the Americans were now showing up in large numbers, the other fact was when you look at the harvest for 1918 and then what happened for the harvest in 1919, um, I would not have wanted to be a German civilian in autumn, winter 1919 if the blockade had been going on, considering how catastrophically bad those two harvests ended up being. And bearing in mind, 1919 was a harvest that was bad, despite the fact there were significantly more workers available for the fields because obviously the war was over and 
they were obviously, as a now peaceful country, open for relief effort and aid and global trade, which they wouldn't have been in 1919. So I wouldn't necessarily, necessarily say it's the decisive part, the way that some previous British blockades had broken European attempts at empire, but it certainly was a decisive element without which I don't think victory could have been achieved, or if it had been achieved, it would have been achieved at much, much greater cost in time and lives. Slam and Sam asks, I was wondering if you could speak some more on the training torpedoes used in fleet problem exercises. It strikes me as odd that they would develop and use these extensively enough to gather target range tables, considering that later on the Bureau of Ordnance was so stingy they refused to test any of their torpedoes pre-war. So there is a key and critical difference between the dummy torpedoes that were tested and the Bureau of Ordnance's refusal to let there be live fire tests of the Mark 14, because there were a few tests of the Mark 14 pre-war, but they were not live tests. They were conversions of Mark 14s into dummy torpedoes by fitting a practice warhead that didn't detonate. And herein lies the problem. In a practice torpedo, you want it back at the end of the exercise. And so the warhead, or the warhead replacement, apart from being inert, and obviously you can't test the functionality of the detonator for obvious reasons, um, what's left of the, the dummy warhead is buoyant. Because the idea is you fire the torpedo, and then if it hits something, great. And if it doesn't, either way, at the end of its run, it floats to the surface and it can be recovered, if necessary, repaired, refueled and reused again. If you use a torpedo with an actual live warhead on it, that's going to be heavier. It's going to have a completely different profile underwater in terms of how it responds to commands, what depth it keeps. And of course, with a live torpedo, you get to see if the detonator actually works. And this was the problem. I mean, when in the video on the Mark 14, one of the things I covered is that the one of the problems with the Mark 14 running too deep was that the depth settings had been configured for test or dummy Mark 14s using the lightened warhead, the dummy warhead, so that they could be recovered, which you know gave them a false idea about where the torpedo would run on certain settings. You then stick a heavier actual warhead on it, and now the torpedo runs deeper. That was basically the the bit the big problem that was involved plus of course obviously as i said you know you can't test the mark 6 exploder with a uh, properly with a dummy warhead and they didn't want to test the live ones and it's the lack of live testing that caught that well didn't cause the problems with the mark 6 but it caused the problems with mark 6 to not be picked up um, they did they did love being able to recover their lovely highly expensive shiny torpedoes afterwards Colin Williams asks, With the understanding that their eclectic array of armoured carriers would soon be unable to handle the ever-increasing size of aircraft, could the cash-strapped Royal Navy have procured Essex-class carriers to meet their needs? In the first place, would the US Navy have parted with their surplus Essexes? And if not, would they have allowed the Essex-class production lines to start back up as it would be both cheaper and be able to be delivered faster than any carriers domestically produced in British yards? With some slight modifications, of course. Uh, to begin with, how many carriers would the Royal Navy like to have, and what is the minimum that they can get by with? If the US Navy accepts in either case, this will obviously require a lot of cash that the Royal Navy doesn't have, so how much extra would it cost the Royal Navy after the gradual transfer of all their fleet carriers with other odds and ends to the US for scrapping and whatever uses the US Navy has, plus the possibility of a new ships for bases deal to sweeten it all? Would the Royal Navy be willing to stomach that expenditure for the advantages it possesses? And how long do you see this fleet staying in service, especially if they receive the same general refits as the US Navy's own Essexes in service? So there are a few problems. Firstly, when the US Navy is the most likely to part with their Essexes is in the late 40s, say 48 probably, when they've just decommissioned a ton of them. That's the point where the Royal Navy can probably least afford to buy anything new. And then you've got the Korean War, and with the Korean War and the rise of the Soviet Union and the Iron Curtain in the early 50s, basically every Essex class that exists, with the exception of Bunker Hill and uh, Franklin, are all hauled back out 
and recommissioned over the early 50s in various forms, some as car- actual carriers, some as assault ships, some as helicopter carriers, whatever. But basically, the US Navy now has uses for them, in addition to all the big um, the big super carriers that they're building. So the one window where they're going to be able to, the, where the Royal Navy theoretically could pick up one or two or more, is also the window where they can least afford to do so. The other issues are i mean they could theoretically pick up franklin and bunk hill since the u.s navy never recommissioned them they're holding on to them for a rainy day but that's not going to be anywhere close to enough um, in the early 1950s albeit that some of them were operating as training carriers and some of them would soon be sold for scrap the royal navy actually had a huge number of carriers floating around they had uh, uni- not in counting uh, your escort carriers and other stuff that then was going to be getting gotten rid of. They had Unicorn, they had the four illustrious class, they had the two implacables, they had most of the dozen or so colossuses. Um, they they sent one or two, they sold one or two, but they still had most of those. The Majestics, to be fair, um, pretty much all had gone to other navies, uh, but they obviously had Eagle and Ark Royal still building, would be commissioned in the middle, in the sort of early to mid-50s, and they had the Centaurs, um, Centaur, Albion, Bulwark and Hermes, all under construction as well, and they would come into service again in the mid to late 50s. So there were a lot of carriers around, and the Royal Navy also appreciated it needed bigger carriers. It's not just the hangar height, it's also just the sheer size, and this was one of the problems the Essexes had. They might have the hangar height to to accommodate aircraft, but they can't accommodate as many because the aircraft have gone larger, and also their flight decks. um, The irony is that the armoured flight decks could hold up to fairly strong... They were fairly strong, so they could hold up to quite heavy aircraft as time went on. The Essex class, one of their big limitations was that unless you completely reworked them you weren't going to be able to operate too heavy an aircraft off of them, even before the size of the flight deck came came in, which is why a lot of them ended up as um, aircraft, as, as carriers for helicopters and so forth, and why the ones that remained carrying fighters didn't operate the biggest and heaviest and latest jet fighters. So whilst the Essexes have some advantages over, say, the armoured carriers, which ended up on the scrap heap during the 50s, they also still have their disadvantages. Would the US allow the Essex production lines to start back up? Um, No, probably not. Um, Because by the time the war is over, okay, there are some Essexes still on on the uh, stocks ready to go um, and then cancelled and and scrapped uh, in the immediate aftermath of the war. But by the time the Royal Navy's in any position to actually afford to think about a whole-scale fleet replacement program for their carriers, which is at the very earliest would be the, 50, the late early 50s, the Americans have gone on to building the midways and the forestals. They're not going to be interested in going back to a smaller design. Um, and the Royal Navy would need a lot, because the Royal Navy was still a very large navy in the late 40s and early 50, and 50s going obviously began to diminish in the late 50s going into the 60s but it still had several hundred ships frontline warships in the 50s and getting hold of even uh, Bunker Hill and um, Franklin wouldn't do them much good because one of the problems that they have is that they've got all these different classes as I said you've got audaciouses you've got colossuses illustriouses implacables plus unicorn um, and the centaurs, they've all got slightly different operational requirements and they all offer slightly different capabilities. Throwing another class with completely different machinery and weapons requ- and electronics requirements into the mix, you know, is just making things worse. Even if you use them to get rid of another class, maybe, you know, get rid of the illustrices, replace them with two, two Essexes, well, you've still got just as many classes around only when now one of them is even more different from all the others so that would be a, a significant problem as well now there are i think possibly two 
circumstances in which the Royal Navy could possibly get hold of American carriers to replace its own carrier fleet. The first would be in perhaps the late 50s, early 60s, when a lot of the Royal Navy's carriers are going into the scrap heap. So the armoured carriers go then, a bunch of the Colossuses go then, the Royal Navy's drastically slimming down. So that reduces the number of carriers the Royal Navy needs, although they still have quite a few. Um, and it's just before they start the absolutely disastrous upgrade of Victorious. So there's that. Now, in those circumstances, you could maybe make an argument for, at that point, then the US Navy's coming a little bit down from its panic of the early 50s and has begun some of the SBC upgrades for the Essexes. So maybe at that point in the late 50s, early 60s, if the Royal Navy had come along and said, okay, we're you know, we're going to scrap everything bar Audacious, sorry, bar Ark Royal and Eagle, maybe keep one of the Centaurs, probably Hermes, around as a, as a training ship, and we want to just job lot replace everything else with half a dozen uh, SBC 27 Essexes or something like that, I mean, or whatever the latest up SBC upgrade was at that point. That might have worked especially considering around about that time there was a there was a sort of a brief flirtation with buying american stuff the other option would have been a little bit later on now this does require british politicians to de demonstrate foresight and insight and uh, general sanity and a degree of actually caring about their country so of course it's never going to actually happen but if we had some hypothetical actual worthwhile politicians instead of, you know, sending the, the leavings of uh, our public and private schools off to pretend to be in charge. Um, then in the early 60s, when they were considering um, CVA-01 as a project to replace Britain's existing carrier fleet, they looked at something the size of the Kitty Hawks. They decided that the they weren't going to go for it because it would require... Up upgrades to existing shipyards to accommodate them a perennial issue but a slightly better set of uh, people might have turned around and gone actually you know what the americans are already building the kitty hawks so uh the uk building its own kitty hawk sized carriers okay that's probably going to be too expensive um because we're going to have to design the whole things from the ground up but you know, split the, split the jobs a little bit. We'll, we'll ensure employment in for Britain by expanding the yards to accommodate a ship of this size. And maybe we'll insist on, you know, a technology transfer and the ships being built in British yards. But what we'll do, do is, since by this point, you know, Kitty Hawk and Constellation are, have already been launched, if we're talking about into the early 1960s, um, and the other two are, well, just about to be laid down and soon to be laid down, respectively, we can get in on a batch production run. So, you know, the long lead items for the JFK are still under under order. So, you know, get get in on that. Say to the Americans, basically, we'd like to buy some, some Kitty Hawks, maybe buy four, um, and maybe do a deal kind of like the Japanese did with the Congos with Britain back in the 1900s, where maybe the first one is built in the US and then the others are built in the UK. So it keeps some, it'll keep the British yards in work, but it also ensures that you do a wholesale replacement of the entire remaining British carrier fleet with two or ideally four Kitty Hawks, because um, they were originally going to do four CVA-01s. In practice, it would have worked. Financially, it probably could have been made to work, and it certainly would have set the Royal Navy up for a very nice and competent future for the next three or four decades. But as I said, that assumes that the politicians actually do their jobs for a change instead of just lining their back pockets and setting themselves up for retirement in sinecure positions. And uh, so it was not to be. And finally, Switch374 asks... You've several times discussed raking fire as shooting into the bow or stern of a ship so that the cannibal goes the length of the ship, inflicting damage along its path, most recently when you're at the stern of HMS Unicorn. 
I was reading an account of Captain Nelson in the 64-gun Agamemnon's engagement of the French 80-gun Saira after Captain Fremantle of the Inconstant, 36, and Commander Gibson of the Cutter Fox had raked the Saira. Whilst the Saira was under tow, Agamemnon spent about two hours firing broadsides into her stern, after which Saira was turned broadside to engage and apparently fought off the Agamemnon. Although Saira was apparently badly damaged, my question is why, after two hours, was she still able to fight the British off? I would have thought she would have been pretty much destroyed after two hours of raking fire from a 64-gunner. Basically, it's a matter of range and angles. So, the perfect raking broadside, the kind of thing that can gut a ship and render it combat incapable in one or two salvos, is where you get a near-perpendicular cross and you're at basically point-blank range, so you can guarantee that near enough 100% of your firepower is just going to be dumped into the ship and go screaming along, as I described in previous videos. However, Agamemnon's engagement of Saira was not quite the same. She was engaging at considerably longer range, which of course means far fewer of her rounds are actually going to hit, and when they do hit, they're going to hit with less energy, and secondly because she's engaging at a longer range, the angles are not quite as favourable. So she is raking the Saira in as much as she's firing on her stern, but Agamemnon's not always able to make a perfect 90 degree pass in order to get the optimal angle, and even if she had, as I said, not as many rounds would have hit. Um, so you would have hits that would be hitting the stern area of the ship's sides, embedding themselves, maybe going through, maybe bouncing off. Um, ship uh, hits that are going in through the stern but then again maybe embedding themselves in the inner hull some that will be ricocheting down but it'll be a much much smaller number per broadside than it would be if you get the classic nelsonian melee where you're up close and personal um agamemnon unfortunately having to stand off from the engagement so that's basically why satyra just was eventually found to be badly damaged but wasn't completely destroyed by it basic essentially because the raking fire was a long distance angled affair with therefore much less lethality than the up close and personal uh, raking the, of the kind that you get at Trafalgar and in a number of other battles and that concludes part two of the Patreon dry dock for this month thank you very much for listening um, if all is going as planned I am in Canada at the point that you are listening to this and obviously, being in Canada, I'm not necessarily sure I'll be able to do the alternate history Q&A on the weekend we normally do it. So effectively, if you had an alternate history question, a question that hasn't been answered in the past two parts, apologies for that, then you need to look out for either, I'll try and do it from Canada if I can, or if I can't, then I'll have to do it the first weekend I'm back from Canada. So you have a, probably a mid-month Patreon live stream instead. In any case, thank you very much for listening. Let me know in the comments below what you think of the new format. Does it work? Has the follow-on link worked? Etc. and so on. And hopefully see you again in another video. Bye.